So we're here with Frank Justra, who's an internationally renowned business person, but is also someone who's accomplishing a lot with his life. I like reading about his living a purposeful life. So what we want to be able to do is to talk to Frank and have him tell us a little about who we are. And of course, I'm here with Carmelina Cupo, and we'll both run this through for Frank. Good afternoon, Frank. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, everybody. So I, I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about, I think everybody knows about your accomplishments in business. There's also the, the component of you have an Order of Canada that was given to you. Uh, you run the Fiore Group. You're a director on the International Crisis Group. You're part of the Clinton Justra Initiative. You do so many things, but it's really the Justra Foundation that I think is really accomplishing a lot globally. Maybe you can tell people a little more about the Justra Foundation. Okay, well, um, it's been around for over 20, almost 25 years. Um, and it's a foundation I started in the late 90s. Uh, and uh, it, initially it was focused on local activities, only local activities, mostly, you know, helping organizations on the downtown east side, working a lot with the food bank. But I really didn't get into the philanthropic part of my life until about 2005. And then everything just kind of blew up. And I between 2005 and 2007, I spent uh, two years traveling around the world with Bill Clinton, um, supporting his HIV AIDS initiative, which was a brilliant initiative that saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives. And I gave that a lot of my support. I was the biggest supporter, single supporter for that um, initiative. And then in 2007, I made a, a very fundamental decision about my life. I was gonna focus mostly on philanthropy, a lot less on business, and I just, changed my life completely and it kind of grew from there and <laughs> we're involved in a number of initiatives around the world uh, a lot which we created a lot which, uh, some in which we participate in and sponsor but it it goes across the spectrum of uh, social issues uh, my biggest I think the one that gets the most funding and has for the last 13 years has been what was the Clinton Justra Enterprise Partnership, which is now, we've taken it out of the Clinton Foundation as of last year. It's now a separate organization, which uh, is my foundation called Accesso, which is separate to the Juster Foundation. It's registered as a charitable organization in the United States. And its whole mandate is poverty alle alleviation at scale, and uh, at scale and in, in sustainable ways. That was the original mandate that we uh, launched with Bill Clinton in 2007. And it was an idea that I had about how to alleviate poverty by creating jobs and raising incomes, which was to me the only sustainable approach to alleviating poverty. So we um, invested a lot of money, it was all my funding, um, to come up with a model that would work. And it took us many years. We tried everything. A lot of, all the things that we did in the first sort of five years of it we're all great. We helped a lot of people um, in Colombia and Peru, Haiti, El Salvador, uh, Indonesia, India, uh, a few countries in Africa. But what we, we were looking for something that would really be scalable and sustainable for the long term and transferable to a lot of different geographical areas, not just one single geographical area. And we uh, <clears throat> we finally settled on about five years ago, six years ago, on the farmer services model, which um, if I could describe it in very simple terms, it takes the demand, we, we identify where the demand for a specific product is, um, and then we reverse engineer that demand all the way back to small farmer producers. We organize them so that they can deliver at quantity and at the quality, quality levels that are required by these large, more institutional buyers. We give them the inputs, fertilizers and seeds. We train them, we give them technology, and then we create the supply chain in between to get said product from the farmers on a collective basis all the way up to the end buyer. 
And it's a model that we developed. It took us years to prove that it works. It's, we, we call it a social enterprise because each, each initiative is its own business. Now it's not a business, it's a business that's intended to generate profits, but the profits stay in the foundation. It's not, you know, it's not no one's taking those profits out for, for, their, for, own, for their own gain. These are profits that we recycle into new initiatives. So the, what, and, the, and the reason it's designed that way is because that's the only way it's going to work in the long term. It's going to be something that's market driven. Otherwise, it's, you know, you're just really providing grants and that's more of a charitable activity. And I was trying to get away from that. So that is, Accesso is my biggest single area where I, where, 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 I, uh, where I put my resources. And we are in Colombia in a number of locations. We're in um, Haiti. And we're in El Salvador, um, and we've uh, we're now looking at other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we will be expanding that and growing it as we prove the model out. We're now that the model is working and is working on a in a sustainable way. We're bringing in big partners, big um, multinational corporations and organizations, nonprofits that see that the model is working and want to be part of it. So that's. As I said in 2007, when I launched that, that's my life's work. That will be my life's work, and that I will continue to do as long as, as I'm around, and hopefully even longer. <laughs> um, so uh, that's Accesso. Um, the next important thing in my life is Crisis Group. You mentioned that yes. I'm a director. I'm actually co-chair. I was just made co-chair um, three, four months ago, um, and I've been on the board for 15 years. It's the world's preeminent organization to uh, end conflict or prevent conflict, deadly conflict, meaning wars, yes, mostly yes. wars. Um, not a lot of people hear about the work we do because it's very complex. We work a lot with, um, we have research analysts on the ground all over the world in every conflict area you can imagine. And we produce, produce quality on the ground research that's non-biased. We talk to all sides. You know, we don't just take a position. We actually have people on the ground that talk to all sides if possible, come up with uh, a report and recommendations as to how to end the conflict or prevent a conflict from taking place. And then we advocate and lobby. And we take those recommendations to every relevant player in a conflict, which could mean the, the parties involved. It could mean the regional players, it could mean uh, European Union, it can mean NATO, it can mean the United States, uh, the UN, and our research and recommendations are highly trusted. And as a result, we've had some amazing, you know, good news results. Uh, we were instrumental in um, finding the or uh, helping with the peace agreement between the Colombian government and the FARC rebel group, which was a 50-year insurgency in Colombia that uh, finally came to an end a few years ago. President Santos, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, gave us a lot of credit for that, um, for that work. We were instrumental in the original Iran uh, nuclear deal that was yeah. in, uh, with, with, uh, which involved the US yes. and, and European countries and, and, and Russia, and which now Trump has repudiated. But we were instrumental in, um, in putting that agreement together back in 2013. Um, we were instrumental last year in preventing a catastrophe in, in Yemen when the Saudi co coalition was planning an attack on the, on, on, on the Ye Yemenese port, which is the only port that receives um, uh, food and medicine from around the world. You had almost 20 million people on the verge of starvation in Yemen, and this attack would have been all turned a catastrophic situation into like the, the worst situation anybody could possibly imagine, and we helped prevent that from happening by, you know, commencing talks uh, between the parties um, and the UN, with a UN sponsored talk. So we do a lot of that kind of work. So that, I, as I said, I took the co-chair role a few months ago um, and, you know, I will give it a number of years of my life and that is now taking up most of my time. And that's, you know, it's a big job. We came in at a very difficult time with the COVID pandemic hitting at the same time, almost the same week I was announced. You know everything kind of fell apart, so it's you know it, you know this pandemic has made our work very difficult because 
we can't get our people on the ground in certain places. You have a yeah. lot of refugee camps and IDP camps in places that have no health infrastructure. And it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, um, you know, I'm very proud of it. And that's, you know, I think that that is going to take up most of my time for the next th at least three to five years. So uh, that's the crisis group. Um, I, I've been involved in many refugee issues since yes. the Syrian refugee crisis back in 2015. I got very much involved in that. Went to Lesbos, Greece. I was in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and went back and forth a number of times, created a number of initiatives to provide basic humanitarian aid where it didn't exist. Um, it was a time when the traditional players just were not in Greece, especially, did not have their act together, and uh, because it was it was a brand new thing, you know, a, a refugee crisis in Europe, you know, it 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 was was something that people weren't prepared for. So we did a lot in terms of of providing basic humanitarian aid and housing. Um, I tried a, a, a number of things that I won't get into, but just smaller initiatives in and around the refugees in that part of the world, and then we brought it home to Canada. And I don't know if you know, but Canada has this private sponsorship model for refugees, which has been around since the late 70s. Yes. During yes. the Vietnamese boat crisis, they initiated this. This is where the Canadian government allowed individuals or group, community groups, to come together and sponsor refugees. Yes. Uh, for, you know, and their families for a period of one year. And it's a model that's worked very well in Canada. Canada has a great reputation for the way it treats its refugees and the way we welcome, integrate them into our communities. As, and, and which is very different than the way it's done in other places. So when, when the refugee crisis happened in 2015, we noticed the world was starting to take notice. So we created the um, Global Refugee uh, Sponsorship Initiative, which was a joint undertaking between my foundation, Open, Soci Open Society, which is George Soros Foundation, the Government of Canada and the UNHCR and the University of Ottawa. And we uh, basically, it was designed to help educate and implement educate other countries that were yes, interested yes. in our model and and implement them implement the same models in those countries and we've probably we've implemented probably up to 10 countries now we have another 20 on the waiting list so that's we're very proud of that because that's you know that's something that you know just had to be done you know we need to we have a real refugee problem in the world today there's 70 <laughs> 70 million people living in either refugee camps or uh, internally displaced people within the countries of the conflicts, wow. and uh, they need to be resettled. They need they need to have a home. They need to have a future, and it's a big job. Obviously, you know there are a lot of people working on that, but it's something that we're proud that we're taking the Canadian model and shipping it overseas. I've been involved in humanitarian relief efforts after disasters. I work with All Hands and Hearts on on those initiatives which gets volunteers on the grounds immediately after disasters to kind of do all the cleanup yes. and some of the house fixing that needs to be done on and we i did some work in peru and puerto rico on that um i worked with lots of other organizations but those are the main international initiatives i sponsor some other organizations which i'm not directly involved in but they do great work so um at home is all you know it's a whole different area. Uh, the Juster Foundation here has uh, been very much involved in the homelessness issue. We, I was one of the co-founders of the Street to Home Foundation, which yes, we launched yes. in 2010 here in Vancouver, which brought together a plan that included the BC government, the city of Vancouver, and a number of organi local or organizations and private funders like myself yes. to address the homelessness uh, situation in Vancouver, which as you know, is a, it, it continues to, to be a, a problem here. Um, I've been mentoring teens at risk for 23 years, working with the Boys Club Network and with the East uh, Van Boys and Girls uh, yes, Club. Right. Um, and uh, I love that work. That is, I mean, that is probably my favorite work because I do a lot of mentoring myself. I've mentored one-on-one. -on -one for over 20 years, a lot of kids were now grown-ups, uh, lots of groups, and I do a lot of speaking, and I think it helps. I believe it. We, we've seen that it works, and, you know, the idea that if you show you care to these teens that don't have sort of a male image in their life that they can look up to, um, and you do it with support, 
it, it makes the world of difference how these kids turn out. And now I've seen these kids now, some of them in well into their thirties. Now I stay in touch with them and one or two are friends of mine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and they, I started mentoring them when they were like 16, 17 years old. And so that, that one's really important to me. And, and lately we've been involved when the COVID crisis hit, we created an emergency meal program, much like the one you were describing earlier, uh, except we worked with a catering company that was basically had 100% capacity available when everything came to a grinding halt. So my foundation worked with the city of Vancouver and a number of uh, uh, delivery organizations yeah. to provide yeah. ready-made meals, especially to the elderly, people that during COVID couldn't or didn't want to take the risk to leave their homes. Yeah. And so that, you know, we're pretty proud about that. So that's, I think that covers generally what, <laughs> what I do. Well, um, <laughs> Well, I think and, it's, that's a lot. <laughs> it's, it is a lot, and it, it is my life. I, a few months ago, when I took on the chairmanship, a co-chair role of Crisis Group, I actually put out a news release that I would, from that point forward, really remove myself from business, direct business. I mean, I'll still invest because I love investing, but yeah. <laughs> as far as having direct roles in management or sitting on boards, you know, all the stuff that I've done for my entire life, I just decided that it was time to focus the rest of my life on the things that I care about the most. And that's really the philanthropic part. Well, hope that answers your question. I, you know what? I, I, what I think it demonstrates, Frank, is you're working uh, with, with issues that are about peace, they're about humanity. They're really about making sure that people have an opportunity to create sustainable livelihoods for themselves. That's incredibly important that you do it globally. But Carmelina and I, uh, last week or two weeks ago, also interviewed Jimmy Crescenzo and yeah. Tanya Zambrano for the exceptional work that they do that you support. So it's not only that you're having words with national and international leaders, you're talking to the kids at the East End Boys Club to make sure that they're getting the, the support that they need to do well. So, I mean, that's... That's an incredible it's variance, isn't it? It is. But like I said, it's some of my favorite work is working with those teenage boys because I can see the results. And it's so easy. It doesn't even require money. It requires your time and that you <laughs> yes. show you care for people. They just want to know that somebody cares. That's all they want to know. That's it. And you know what? Jimmy said the exact same thing, and so did Tanya. And it's so nice to hear you, Frank, talk the way you're talking now because it really just shows that, you know, like – starts it starts with the kids it starts at the bottom like that and and you know just that little the the bit the talking that you do and the you know you going in there and mentoring and having those conversations from the heart to these kids makes all the difference like that's huge and it touches you too i mean that's that's like pulls at your heartstrings you know so like i said i enjoy it I, yeah i'm very proud yeah. of that work very proud yeah, yeah well wonderful. you you know the you grew up in an italian canadian family you're doing all of these things. I, you know, I, I hear you talk about passion translating to excellence, which translates to success. And that passion is contagious. There is no doubt that there's a lot of passion in our Italian heritage. Uh, do you think that had a little bit of influence <laughs> on you? Oh, well, damn right it did. Um, <laughs> listen, when people ask me, to, you know, for the secret sauce to success, and I, I usually say, listen, I can't, my life was my life. I had my very unconventional path. I had no roadmap to my success. It was just right. things happen. The world is different today. I couldn't draw somebody else's roadmap for how to success. I wouldn't even know where, where to start today if I was starting out. But the one thing that I always do say is, whatever you do, love it. Make yeah. sure you love it. And do it passionately. And if you do that, that's not a guarantee to success, but it's certainly a prerequisite. If you don't have a passion and you don't love what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you can get it. And I think it, it, it is contagious. When you're passionate about something, whether you're selling a product, an idea, or a philanthropic, you know, whether it's philanthropy, whatever, you're always selling something to people around you. They need to see it in your eyes. They need to know that you believe. Once they once they're convinced you believe, it's contagious. They start to believe. It's it's amazing how it works. But it has to come from the heart. You can't fake this stuff. 
That's they right. can't pretend to believe or pretend to care or pretend to be passionate. It's either in you or it's not. So I only choose things that I've my whole life, whether it's been my careers, you know, I've had three or four careers in my life. Each yeah. time I tackle something new, it's because I loved it. I mean, I was just I just got into it. It was like my thing for that moment in time. And it and the same goes to everything I do. I mean, I and I write a lot about this stuff, as you know. Yes. Um yeah. And uh, no, I just absolutely believe, and you mentioned, <laughs> it's funny, that was a YouTube, the speech that's on YouTube, the one you mentioned about uh, passion begets excellence, which begets success. I did that when I was promoting my olive oil in New York at the New York International exactly. Olive Oil Competition. They asked me to come up and speak. And I'm, like, I'm not an expert, you know, it's all an audience of judges, oil, and I'm going, I'm, what am I going to speak to them about? You know, the, the acidity levels. I, of, of all, so I said, well, I said, can I speak about anything? They, they said, yeah, whatever you want. Just get up there and talk. So I talked about my life. Yes. But I did it in the context of saying that everything that I did, I was passionate about. And yeah. for the most part, I've been, it created an excellent product or business or whatever. It was like the best of its category, whatever, whatever I was doing. Yes. And that then it's what followed was success. So, the, you know, you start with passion, you end up with success. And if you have an hour of your time, I think it was an hour of speech, maybe it was 45 minutes, go on YouTube and you'll find this on Frank Juster with, and you know, if you want to really dig deep into how passion truly works. I, That's you know, I, let's talk about that um, because you said that you were going to create the best olive oil in the world. <laughs> and Domenica Fiore was born. And it's named after your mother, isn't it? And the reason it's named after my mother, yes, Domenica Fiore was her maiden yeah. name. Uh, all my companies, my private companies, are all called Fiore. You obviously know I admired my mother a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> she was a lot, a lot. And like, like every Italian kid, my, I will say this, my mom was the best cook in the world. I know everybody <laughs> says that, but mine truly was. And so it was her cooking that inspired me to start cooking myself. As I, when I left home in my early twenties, I started to cook. And over the years, I became more and more passionate about cooking. Yes. Pretty soon, I had a reputation for having these big dinner dinner parties, friends, family, whatever, and cooking all day. And it is truly my number one hobby. I mean, I I spend entire days in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and I love just the idea of cooking. So that cooking, which I got from my mom, actually brought me to the olive oil business. I was in Italy with um, with a woman named Kim Gallivan, who's passed away, unfortunately, uh, a couple of years ago. But she was my executive assistant many years ago when I ran the investment bank. And then she left, and uh, she went to Italy and set up an Orvieto, found a villa, renovated it, did the whole Italian under the Tuscan something. Yes. And then we used to go to that villa for vacations. And, and Kim and I and everybody, all my friends, we all love to cook, so we were there one once in the kitchen cooking away and she brings out this olive oil from the cellar and it's like in a non-labeled jug and starts we start putting it on bread with tomatoes and I'm, I'm eating so I'm going, what is this like I knew nothing nothing about olive oil nothing and so I started asking a bunch of questions about why is this better than what you buy at you know Safeway for five bucks a bottle and there, there, there's a reason why this tastes better than the stuff you buy at Safeway. Um, and you'll only know it if you put them side by side and try it. Yeah. You'll see one tastes like motor oil. It's horrible. <laughs> but when you know you're all about So what ended up happening was that we, um, I was introduced to the, the region where we now produce our olive oil. We went and visited the only person that had a local press there at the time. Um, he, he used to press the olives for everybody in, 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 in the valley yeah. around Orvieto. His name was Romano, and he was an Italian music producer who was doing this as a hobby. Wow. <laughs> and I tasted his olive oil, and it was, you know, as good as Kim's, which she got from her own trees. She had 500 trees on her property. Anyways, next thing I know, we're bringing um, some of these samples back home. We thought, well, why not do a taste test? So we went out and bought all the most expensive olive oils we could buy. We bought some in Italy before we left, wow. came to Canada. And we just did it by price because, you know, I had yeah. no yeah. other way to judge, right? <laughs> and we did a taste test, a taste blind taste test in my living room. We had Umberto here and Pino from Chipinos, a whole bunch of food guys. And we did a 
10 oils with one as a blind taste test. And guess, guess what? Guess what came out number one and number two? That oil. And I looked at Kim and I said, that, there was no business plan. I said, Kim, we're now in the olive oil business. That's all I said. <laughs> that was the that was the extent wow. of the that was the extent of the business plan. I promise you, there was wow. no business plan. It was just I said, Kim, go back and with Cesare, who um, she knew and who was her boyfriend and still runs the olive oil operation for us in Italy, who's become a master oil maker over the years. Um, she told I said, go tell Cesare just to buy all of that property on that side of the hill. Why that side of the hill? Because it was an ancient seabed. And the, it was wow. very mineral rich ground. Um, we still find shells and shells and fossils in the dirt when the dirt gets turned over. It's really rich soil. And it sits at the perfect elevation of about 400 meters above sea level. So we don't get the fruit flies. We get the sun all day long on that side of the hill. Which and region is that in? It's in, or, it's in Umbria, which okay, is yeah. uh, just a, it's a town called Orvieto, a beautiful oh, yeah. town. Just, I know it. It's about an hour and a half. Um, from the airport when you land, north, going north, sort of between Tuscany and Rome. Okay. Anyway, so we, then I asked Cesare, and this is why, when you ask, how do you make the best olive oil? Because I did say, I want to make the best olive oil in the world. And I did actually come home and I started telling people that we were making the best olive oil in the world before we made it. <laughs> and it was going to be the best olive oil that was ever made in the history of mankind. So, but I asked, we asked the right questions. And, I said to Cesare, what are the things that ruin olive oil? And obviously oxygen, number one. Like once oil is oxidized, once it's open to the air, it deteriorates very quickly. So we nitrogen seal our tanks and we nitrogen seal our bottles, number one. Heat and light, the two next big killers. How do you get rid of them? We don't do bottles. We do stainless steel, keeps them cool, no light gets in. Um, Time, time kills oil. Oil does not last forever. It's not wine. It doesn't get better with the years. It's got about an 18 month maximum life to be edible. Yeah. Um, so we, what we did was we would pick early in the season, earlier than any other producer in the area, to get a, a more robust flavor from the olive. We'd get less yield because the fruit wasn't as ripe, so you wouldn't get as much yield of olive oil. Well, we sacrificed that yield for taste. So we set, we started. Um, Initially, harvesting early October, most people were late, late October, early November. And we pressed within four hours of picking the olives. That is our rule. Press within four hours. Don't let the olives sit around, you know, gathering flies and stuff. And then we shipped by air our novello. So it would be on the shelves in North America by November. No one does it. I mean, absolutely no one does that in the business. And obviously, it makes it very expensive to produce. And that's why this business will never make money. <laughs> it's, I call it my nonprofit work. And um, I, I hope someday it'll make money, but it certainly hasn't to this stage. It's a labor of love and I will not sacrifice quality for, for, for profit because it's got my mother's name on it. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and so we did all these things and we started winning awards. We started entering the award. Now we're one of the most awarded olive oils in the world. We just won. I just got notice from Cesare this morning. We just won again in Italy, Greece, and Japan all yesterday. Wow. Gold medals across the board. I will be announced wow. in the next couple of days. But um, we we are we kill it in every competition we go to. We are always the number one and certainly the number one Italian olive oil. And so. I started by telling people I was making the best olive oil in the world. Yeah. I believed it. It took us two years to get there, <laughs> and we did it. You know, and it's like, it's just, but we, we made an effort. It wasn't just talk. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to make the best olive oil in the world and then just do what everybody else does. We, we thought about it very carefully, and Cesare has done an amazing job in making this the number one olive oil in the world. And, you know, we, it's organic. Um, you know, we treat our, you know, our, our our trees and our land very well. We're very careful about how we treat everything there. And everything's state of the art now. And what we started doing, and we're the first, um, two years ago, we started harvesting at night. Oh. Yeah, and no you no asked, no. why would you harvest at night? And that's, that's, yeah. our novella, that's our novella de notte, which is now my favorite of all the olives. We only make a limited edition of that because you can't harvest at night the whole time. That's right. Um, so what happens at night? The olives are cooler 
because we harvest so early in the season, in late September, it's still smoking hot in Italy. Mm. It's like it's like summertime still. <laughs> and there's a huge difference of the temperature of the olive between daytime and nighttime. And to you have to be a, under a certain temperature to be considered a cold press. And so we take about four degrees off the olive oil, four to six degrees off the temperature of the olives by harvesting at night. And we actually did the novella both with the daytime harvest and the nighttime harvest, put them side by side, and there's a difference. You can wow. taste you can taste the difference. So that's 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 someone no no one else who harvests. I think some people in the wine business do. I know they do it in some uh, vineyards, but not with olives. Wow. So, so that's my olive oil story. <laughs> so, but but there was a whole process. You went through the analytics. You did all the research, yeah. and you've created what you intended to create. That passion is obviously there. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It's like I said, it's, it, it's a difficult business to actually make money. Really difficult because you can't price the oil at a level where the stores won't put it on the shelf. They just won't put it because it won't move. It's, it's, but, it, you know, it costs us that much to make it. It's not cheap. It, you know, if you want to do something that's really great, it's going to be expensive. And the public is not very well. See, the, it, the, it's not like in wine where the public is well-educated, they've had like decades yeah. to learn and to yeah. appreciate why they would pay, you know, two, three hundred dollars a bottle versus 20. Yeah. In oil, it's, we, we don't have that same level of knowledge in, 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 in the marketplace. Yet. Yeah. Yet. Yet. <laughs> you, you know, you speak a lot about passion and, and, and of course, you know, we as Italians can appreciate that. We know all about it. Um, one thing you mentioned about, uh, Frank, and I just wanted to touch on it briefly, is your mother. Um, you, you had written something under your unsung heroes, a tribute to my mother and the food. Uh, and, food. and I thought that was so beautiful, <laughs> that story about the recipe book and how you yeah. guys all got together with the recipes. It's something that I've always wanted to do with my mother because of course my mother is the best cook in the world. <laughs> of course she is. <laughs> of course she is, right? <laughs> But no, I just, I, I smiled and I laughed through, through that little, you know, excerpt. I just thought it was fantastic and, and such a heartfelt uh, story. And I, I just loved the words that were used. I, I loved how you talked about growing up, um, you know, on the table and how lively it was and how, you know, we're Italian. This is how we are, you know. <laughs> And I just, I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. So thank you for, yeah, for, for sharing you know, that. Thank you. You know what? And I, I meant every word I wrote. You know, yeah. my mother was, you know, I guess to me, she was a saint. I mean, what she went through in her life, how difficult it was to bring us to Canada and, and raise us without a lot of money and feed us well without yeah. a lot of money. I mean, we had my mom and dad grew everything, and I mean everything. The garden was massive. We lived out wow. in the valley, and uh, we grew every vegetable you could possibly imagine. We we ate well, you know. We didn't have a lot, you know, of spending money. And you know, the one thing we had to learn was our work ethic. All of us kids had to have part-time jobs. There was no such thing as an allowance. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we learned that work ethic from my dad, I think. And my mom worked very hard to just raise us, and all she cared about was us. She had no other interest. We tried to get her interested in other things her yeah. entire life. When and when we were growing up, she just focused on the grandchildren. And you know, right. it's just like it. luckily yeah. she she you know uh, and it, and she was around to really, you know, she passed away uh, you know a couple of years ago. And uh, but she was an amazing woman. And uh, you know, I'm so proud of you know having been raised by her. And 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 I, the way I described our meals, that's the way they all were. And that's how I continue to carry that tradition. I have my family over on a regular basis mm -hmm. to do the same thing that, yeah. that we've done for years. I have friends and I, my dinners are 10, 15, 20, 30 people at times. If, you know, I don't care. I love the noise. I love the chaos. I want yeah. everybody in the kitchen standing around I know. watching right. me cook yes. and, and bossing them around to help me. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it's really, um, and go to my, listen, I, I've written several times on you know, similar topics. You, you mentioned one article. There were several. Yeah. Go to my blog, frankjustra.com. I write on a regular basis. I write about everything. I write about finance. I write about geopolitics. I saw I that, about, yeah. I write about, you know, Wonderful. food, about 
everything, you know, I, adventure, you name it. And because I love to write, that's my other passion. Fabulous. I, I, I write a lot, not just for my blog, but I also write for Modern Farmer magazine, which I own, which is about the food movement. I write a regular column in there. I write op-eds and newspapers. Writing has become my new, my new thing. Wonderful. I'm just keeping the cooking, but I'm, writing is my new passion. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, yeah, and you can sign up there to get your uh, your daily updates as well, which I recently did. Good, you're on the when list. I read, when I read your uh, The Unsung Heroes, I started reading, I was like, wow, this is, it was very, very interesting. A lot of really cool things. So yeah, for any viewers that are are, are watching this, you know, do take a look at that because it's it's a lot of fun stuff. And and you know what, it, it really, a lot, a lot of the stuff actually pulls at your heartstrings as well. It's, I love the passion in everything that you write as well, Frank. So thank, thank you for, thank, thank you for you. that, yeah. And, and, you know, in, in the sense of writing, of course, we've, we've looked at everything that you've been putting out there. And one of the things that you talked about is your, uh, your dear rich people, which is kind of an, an interesting take that I, I think you do that for the Huffington Post. But I wanted to take you to another aspect of your writing. Why don't you tell us about the song that you wrote? Songs. Song. Um, well, I, think <laughs> yes. I, I know what song you're referring to. I have a music studio in North Vancouver, which we opened. Um, well, our music studio has been around for in two different locations now for six years. Yeah. Uh, I work with two composer producers, yeah. uh, Ian Prince and Dave Corman, and we write songs. And we write a lot of songs. We write hundreds of songs. We um, work. The reason we have a studio, it started off as a hobby. You know, and I, I can't even tell you how I got into songwriting because it's so wholly unbelievable I, I, I read about it all right <laughs> i don't think i told i don't think i've told the whole story but uh, i'm saving <laughs> that from i'm writing a book which i'll eventually finish and in the book i tell the entire story of how i ended up being a songwriter <laughs> and it's absolutely hilarious anyways you wouldn't it's, it's a hard to believe story but it happened anyways so we created the studio to not just song, write songs for fun but we work with a lot of young local artists yeah. that we see as real talents that um, need help in songwriting. So we work with them and we collectively write, write songs as a group. So I have sessions in my house. I've done sessions on Zoom now, uh, <laughs> but we, have, we do sessions at the studio and it's been a lot of fun. I love writing songs. I don't know which song, Mario, you're referring to well, specifically, but- there's, but- there's one that's on a Sarah McLaughlin album, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I wrote a lullaby. I wrote it for my kids for Christmas a bunch of years ago. Um, and it was it was really meant for my children to give it to them at Christmas. Yes. And then uh, Sarah, who's a good friend, and I support the Sarah McLaughlin yes, School of Music. Say. That's one. I'm one of her biggest, probably her one of her biggest supporters. Yes. So we've yeah. been friends for a long time. Yeah. So uh, Sarah put it to music. Initially as a favor to me so I could give it to my kids for Christmas. And then it was so beautiful. She Aww. said, do you mind if I put it on the album? I said, do Aww. I mind? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and we, we, said, we, we did a deal together. I said, any profits generated by that song, go to the Sarah McLaughlin School of Music. So it's all I for children. Yeah. It was a beautiful lullaby. It's called Little B. And you can find it on one of her albums or on Spotify or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention that you're also a, a supporter of Sarah McLaughlin's here, her school of music that is is a great uh, I, I mean you're I think you've called yourself quite eclectic and I think I, I love the fact that you have an interest in something and it's not a, a tacit interest or a passive interest mm -hmm. it suddenly becomes a passion and you've got to get to that point that drive to excellence right I, I know it's the the passion excellence success but where do you think it comes from? Where's that spark come from? Yeah, obviously I've been asked that a few times. Yes. I'm curious. I have a, you know, you, you either have a curious mind in this world or you don't. You know, I was born curious. Uh, it didn't always serve me well in the beginning because I got into a lot of trouble as a kid because I was just curious <laughs> to try everything. Yeah. And, um, but eventually I got my act together about the age of 19 and decided I wanted to be curious about finance. And uh, that led me on that path for many, many years. And I wanted to be the best at it. And so I worked super hard to do that. I have ADD. I get, after a while of doing something, 
it's like, okay, that's done. Yeah, you're done. Now yeah. what? Now what? <laughs> and, and I find that my whole life, whether it's been my careers or my hobbies, have been a series of what interests me next? What do I need to learn about? And it really has taken me on some, some real journeys that, including quantum physics, which has now been my latest passion for the last number of years. I got into understanding and studying quantum physics. And why would anybody do that? Because it's, it's interesting, it's bloody fascinating. And I've met, and as a result, I've read a lot of books. I've written some articles on quantum physics, and then I got involved, interested in artificial intelligence and consciousness. And so I read a bunch of books on that, wrote some articles. It's all on my blog. Go to my. Yeah, yeah, I saw that on your blog too. I was like, oh, okay. I see what he's doing here. I see what he's if, if, you can't, if you can't sleep at night, yeah. Go to my blog <laughs> and start reading about quantum physics. Yes, yes. Very it cool. is truly a fascinating, once you get into it, it is, yeah. it's mind blowing what it means or could mean about our reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get into it now, but re read the articles. But then through that, I started meeting some really well known physicists. I would locally, imagine. Like, you know, and so, um, Stay tuned, because that might be my next big thing. Um, okay. We're working oh, on something. Okay. Hopefully, it'll, it'll work. You know, but it's it's something that I like reading about. I like writing about. It uh, I just it's it was it was after songwriting. Although I still do the songwriting. It's what got my attention next. <laughs> yeah, wow. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm looking forward to the book and, 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 and more time with the blog because I think there's quite, uh, quite a lot to learn. Just I, I, I love the fact, like I said, that you pick something up. I'm curious. I want to do it. I, I'm going to just learn how to do it. It's not I'm going to fake it. I go all in. No, but I have to but remember, it starts with liking to be interested yeah. in something like yeah. and, qu and quantum physics was a weird one because it was like, who thinks of that as like, I would, I, I hated physics in high school, hated math, hated all sciences. I couldn't stand that. I was, I, I was a musician. I wanted to play my trumpet. And, um, and then all of a sudden at the ripe age or whatever, you know, I decided that I read a book and, and I ended up meeting the author. It's a famous author. His name is Brian Greene. He wrote Fabric of the Cosmos, The Elegant Universe, and I'm just finishing his book, which just came out, which is called uh, Until the End of Time, and um, ended up meeting him, getting to know him, and, you know, which took me on a whole other path, uh, but it's really interesting stuff. Yeah. Now, listen, I'm just curious, and who knows what it'll be next. I, I think right now I've got to focus. I've told myself since taking the role of co-chair, yeah. Christ, I really have to focus on global issues and, and that takes a lot of time you know every week we have webcasts and reports and because there's always something going on and that's that's just time consuming so i think that that's going to be my my job and my, my hobby for the next couple of years yeah world peace is a hobby it <laughs> well no it's not you should call it hobby, but it's certainly an area where i have to devote a lot of my yeah yeah time to i know stay on top of it but, but I mean, how many people can say that, right? I mean, that, that's an incredible journey that you've had. Um, I, the, the, the other thing I, that we kind of skipped over a little bit, and I think it's important because it's something that's really assisted the local scene. And that's when you created and started Lionsgate Studio. Mm -hmm. Right? You, I, I mean, I, I know hearing about that, I think you said you almost had to go into bankruptcy three times. Everybody told you it couldn't be done twice. <laughs> it couldn't be done. It couldn't, everybody's told you it couldn't be done. And they were right. You I, I shouldn't have, you know, I, I, again, it was one of those deals where I, you know, probably should have had a better business plan at the beginning, done things a little bit slower, not to try and do too many things too fast, which is what I did. The mistake that I made is I tried to become too big too quickly and I paid for it uh, with three years of my life being very stressful yeah. um, but we got you know we, we we stuck to it and made some great films and got well known and then eventually got the right management in place by the way the guys we, that I put in there in 2000 or 2001 are still there they're, wow. they're running it yeah. still great guys John Faltheimer Michael Burns 
you know, they're really good at what they do. I went back on the board in 2010 because they asked me to stay another five years. And then I created, Th we created Thunderbird here in Vancouver, which is where my focus has to be yeah, in the yeah. entertainment. I can't, I couldn't be both. So I to step down from the board of Lionsgate again, but Lionsgate was a, that was a, that was a journey. And, uh, <laughs> It's, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, it was great. It worked out well, but man, I'll tell you, that was the toughest three years of my life. Wow. <laughs> but, it, you know, the one thing I, you know, I know I, one of the questions that I was going to ask you, and I don't think I need to ask you this question now because I think you've exemplified it. What I was going to ask you, of course, is if someone wants to emulate what you've done, how would they do that? You don't. You don't because... <laughs> You don't exactly. because there's no there's no secret sauce to what I did. Yes, I had no plan. There was no roadmap. I didn't sit down and go, "This is how I'm going to design my life." It just stuff happens. Yeah. You just have to recognize. You have to keep a positive attitude. Yes, have the passion, obviously, but you have to recognize opportunities and just something in your gut just tells you, yeah. go with it. And it doesn't tell you why or how. And I, like I'm serious. In my investment banking days, I did a couple of revolutionary things that, in hindsight, they weren't planned. They just happened yes. as I went along, you know, and because I just immersed myself in it and things started to happen. You start to recognize the ones you should chase and, and make sure that that part of your plan works. It's a gut, and I, you can't teach gut, um, you know, and I've been lucky. And this is the thing that brought me to philanthropy, and I, I got to make this really clear. Yeah, I worked hard, but lots of people work hard. It doesn't guarantee anything in life. Opportunity is not evenly distributed around the world. You know, yeah, a lot of people yeah. just don't. I had the opportunity. I was in the right place at the right yeah. time when I started yeah. my career. I worked hard, but yeah, so what? I got lucky. Yeah. Things happened to me. You know, someone from above was just, you know, going, ah, good, you know, a little hard work. <laughs> oh, you're gonna see. You know what? And that's what brought me to philanthropy because I realized that all of that success I had wasn't about me. I just got lucky. So. And I started to feel guilty. You know, why, why should I have all this wealth? And so, you know, so that's what that's why I started the foundation in the first place. Was like, and then as I really, as my success really skyrocketed in the first part of this uh, century and in, in the first decade, I thought this is crazy. I mean, I, who needs this kind? I, I money is money is a it's a good thing to have, but it's also a horrible thing. What what it does to people, and I just. I realized that I just, I had enough. I didn't need more. So I, every, all my efforts from a point in time in around 2007 was to build the wealth of my foundation. I don't, you know, I'm comfortable. My kids are well, you know, they were educated, went to school. Everybody's fine. Um, billionaires don't need to be billionaires. I, I wrote an article about that um, yeah. on my blog. It's yeah. called, Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? I Don't. You should read that. And this has been my message to wealthy people either in my writings or in my private conversations with them. I've heard so many billionaires, and a lot of them already do a lot of things, but there are those that don't or don't do enough. And, I'm, and I keep saying to them, what are you gonna do with a billion dollars or 10 billion? What are you gonna do with it? You get, I, I, I did this funny little exercise just to prove the point. I said, pretend you have a billion dollars. Okay, now you've got a billion dollars. Go buy a mansion. Buy a second home, a third home, a cottage, some other home. <laughs> buy a yacht, massive yacht. Go buy a jet airplane, two jet airplanes. Buy jewelry, buy furs, buy art to put on your walls. Yeah. Add that all up. There's still a lot left <laughs> over, like a lot. <laughs> and it's like, what is the point? The only point of wealth is to create more wealth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's gotten to a point in our world where it's become ridiculous the inequality in north america especially in the u.s has gone through the roof and that's a dangerous thing if you study history like i love to study history you know whenever stuff like this happens the reason you're getting all of this um populist po these populist movements yes. all of these so all the social unrest is because there's inequality in the world people feel angry they feel cheated they feel they've been left behind, that the elites are hogging, hogging it all. And that never ends well in societies. It never ends well. You know, and so I urge all of those people that have the billions or the hundreds of millions, 
you've got enough. You're going to live a great life. Yeah. Give it away in a way that's intelligent. Help educate people. Help people, let people are out of poverty. S solve this inequality issue because otherwise we're all going to pay the price. Our children are going to pay the price in, in, a, in, a, in, in a collapsed society. And I think that that's where we're headed. So yeah, it's really important to me. That's why I write about it a lot. And, and, I, and again, it's like all those billionaires out there, most of them, it's not because they work hard. And I know so many of them, they got lucky. They got lucky that the system was on their side. The, you know, the, the cards were stacked in their favor yeah. and they had the opportunity. And it's just like, really, you're a genius because you have a billion dollars? Not really. <laughs> you know, it, it's, so, uh, it's so heartfelt. I mean, I, what you're doing, how you've taken your success and really given back, not just locally, but globally is, is incredible. And the message that you have, uh, you know, there, there's economic ruin and then there's social ruin. And I think you're trying to avoid a bit of both. Social, social, social ruin is what I'm really worried about. And yeah. And yeah, we shall, we should all be. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, we're starting to see those examples. So, I'm happy to hear that you're co-chair of the crisis group uh, and congratulations on that. I, I don't think it was announced. It probably well, it was announced, but it was right. Like I said, it was the same week that COVID, COVID, COVID hit yeah. and the markets crashed and people were losing their job. The, the, the economy was being shut down. It, it, it didn't deserve any headlines yeah. during that week. So <laughs> everything was up in the air. It, don't worry, I, I'm still doing my work. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, I, I, I wouldn't see it any other way. I, you know, I, I want to thank you. Uh, you know, and and Carmelina as well. That this has been, uh, honestly, a, a privilege uh, to be able to, like I said, we met before, but to actually sit down and talk to you, and learn more about you. I think the community is going to appreciate it because you've served the Italo Canadian community so well locally. But to see that name, Justra, globally, I think is incredibly uh, honorable to all of us and has made all of us incredibly proud of what you've accomplished and how you go about doing it. Mm -hmm. So thank you uh, from myself, uh, Carmelina. Yeah, thank you so much for, and, and for devoting your time to all these amazing causes, for everything that you do, for your service to others, for... Um, you know, not only to our local community, but the community abroad as well. You know, we're definitely proud to call you one of our own. And, uh, and like Mario said, you know, thank you. Just thank you so much for, for everything, for taking the time to chat with us today about all the things that you had talked to us about and, and opening it up also to your family and letting us know a little bit about your mother and where you came from. I think that's also very, very important that this is not just, you know, you weren't, you're not born into it. You know, you started like, you know, right, you know, where everybody starts at the bottom, you know, and you kind of worked your way up. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And it shows the passion, the dedication, and we're very proud uh, to call you one of our own. So thank you thank so much. You. <laughs> Guys, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure, great conversation. And guess what? We've been exactly one hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everything.